All right, we need a little bit more woo than that on the count of three. One, two, three. Man, I, I just I just love a church that's excited. I love a church. Hey, wake that guy up over there. You know, okay. No. I love a church that's excited and full of the Holy Spirit. Too many times, uh, young Christians or wannabe Christians, like, well, I used to have a life, and then I became a Christian. You know, and it becomes about all the things we can't do, all the rules and the regulations. Christ invited us to a new life. And just listening to our choir and thinking about that day. And we are not of this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We're looking for a better world to come. And on that day, we're going to shout in joy with the victory. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Well, thank you for those of you who did show up. You guys are the tough crowd because you showed up. We know that the Easter Sunday is usually the high Sunday, meaning the highest attended Sunday of the year all the way throughout the world, not just from our church, all churches. And then the Sunday after, you know what it's called? Low Sunday. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, we, we celebrated last week so much, we're going to have to take a week off. Uh, but you guys said, nope, 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 we're going to go to church today, and we're excited about it. If you're excited, let me hear you shout, amen. 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 Well, I do have a question for you this morning as we get started. How many of you have ever prayed for a miracle? Let me see your hands. Have you just whatever kind of miracle? It might have been for healing. I know when I was a kid, thank you for participating. Did you guys participate back here? All right, got a few of you. All right, good. Some head nods going on. You know, there's, I've, I've shared with you that I'm a cradle Christian. My great, great, great grandfather was a circuit writer in the Methodist church. And, and so I, I knew why I was a Christian. I knew why I was a Methodist because my parents were and my grandparents, my great grandparents and, and all of that. But even so, there was always times where I read the scripture and I said, I want to live in a day and age like them. When people saw you acting with the Israelites, when they were coming out of Egypt and a cloud by day and a fire by night and, and Moses and, and seeing the plague, seeing all these kinds of things. And, and I pray, I, I said, Lord, just move something. Just, just move the candle just a little bit. Just, you know, just let me know that you're there. Um, he did not move the candle, but he moved my heart along the way. Um, I, I think about that as I thought about the, the moving of the candle part because it literally was a prayer of mine somewhere along the way. In my growing faith, it's not that I didn't believe. I just wanted some more confirmation that God is real, Jesus is real, Easter is real, that the new life is real. And, and I just want a little bit more of the confirmation. So I just said, Lord, please do something, do a miracle. If you do a miracle, then I'm going to believe in you. But I also think many of us are truly like the little boy, uh, the four-year-old little boy that was always afraid at night. How many of you were afraid at night when you were four years old, right? Nobody. Come on, people. This goes faster. Thank you for participation. The rest of you are liars. We know it. And you, but you need to be here, right? But the four-year-old little boy, he would, he would just creep into his parents' room and mommy and daddy, I'm afraid. And they would, one of them would get out of bed, usher him back into bed and say, that's okay, don't forget, God is with you. And then they would go out. Three or four times it happened and find that God is with you. And that was supposed to comfort him. And the little boy on the way out, the parents' way out the room, you could hear this trembling little voice say, okay, God. I know you're here, but so help me if you move anything, you're going to scare me to death. <laughs> right? We, we all pray for a miracle, but then sometimes. I, I, my pastor that I had when I was growing up as a kid, he said he prayed for countless people that always wanted to get healed and get better. He was in the bed uh, room of uh, the hospital of a 99-year-old woman. And as pastors, we don't want to assume. So he asked, said, what do you want? And she said, I want to get better and go home. And he's like, home or home? And she wanted to go home to her home. And he's like, okay, I'll pray for it, but I don't think it's gonna happen. As soon as he prayed, she got up out of the bed and he says, what are you doing? She said, I'm healed and I'm going home. He said, Lord, that was cool. And please don't ever do that to me again because it just shocks the system because we're not used to that. Well, 
we would like to think that we're better than the people in the Bible. You don't have to raise your hand, but many times I thought, how dumb are you people? Come on, man. You know, we, we feel like God is invisible. We don't see him every day. We don't see his hand working. We don't get the cloud by day, the fire by night. We don't get the, road, the, the stone tablets. And we didn't get the stone tablets point two, you know, when... That's only funny if you know the story. He broke the tablets and had to get a whole new pair. How do you go back to God and say, you know those commandments? I broke them. Do you have an extra set around? Can I get another copy of those? And, but, you know, to, to think about what it was like. And, and, and so I've always thought to myself, I'm better than them. If I saw the things that they saw, I would never struggle. I would never doubt. And so we have a tendency to think that we're better than all those people who lived back then whose stories are recorded in the scripture. Nope, we're not any better than them. But I think about it, I think about the Israelites that were slaves for 400 years in Egypt calling out to God he finally sends Moses to lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And he does not one, not two, not three, but he does 10 incredible supernatural acts, feats, plagues upon the Egyptians so that they'll see that he is the one true God and he, they will let their people go. And as the people are walking out of Egypt, are you sure it's okay? It's okay. You know, Pharaoh says it's okay. But here, lovely Israelite people, take our gold and silver with you as you go. It's like, okay, please, you, know, you know, all the candlesticks, all these things, they're loading them up with gold and silver. And the people had to be leaving going, woo our God is good. He's come for us and he's gonna lead us into the promised land. But no longer, the sooner than they get to the Red Sea, then they begin to see the cloud. Pharaoh has changed his mind again. How many of these mighty acts of God did Pharaoh see? And yet his heart was hardened and he changed his mind again. So he sent the army after them. The people are now afraid and saying, thanks a lot, Moses. Thanks a lot, God, for bringing us out here to die in the desert. And what does God do? But opens up the Red Sea for all the Israelites. I don't know how they walked, you know, it's a kind of a strut. It's like, woohoo! They, they walked on dry land. I, I, I imagine this wall of water on the other. It's like, are you seeing this, Margaret? Yes, I am. This is incredible. They walk through on dry land. And the minute they get on the other side, Moses goes up on the mountain to hear about God. He's gone for 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but he's just gone for 10 minutes. And suddenly they come to Aaron and say, here's some gold. Make us a God. And then Moses comes back down because God says, hey, you turned your back and the people aren't doing right. So you need to go back over there. And he said, what are you doing? And Aaron, can you imagine just Aaron's face? Uh, uh, have you ever been caught before? Right? Red-handed? What are you doing? And Aaron basically responds, it's those people. He pointed to the choir. Those people. They, they made me do it. And we threw some gold in the flower, fl fire and out jumped a golden calf. What are we supposed to do? Get rid of the calf. Stop wishing to go back to Egypt. But that's not enough. As they continued their journey, God brought water out of a rock. Anybody been really thirsty, been walking through the desert, or you really just want a drink of water, right? And God brought water out of a rock. When they were hungry, he brought in quail. He brought in manna from the heaven. He fed them every bit and walked with them, talked with them through Moses along the way. And then when they did get to the promised land, they march around seven times around Jericho, toot their little horns, and the walls fall down. And so you're thinking, these are definitely, how smart are these people because they're following God. God's come and he's revealed himself in miraculous ways. Ten minutes later, they were worshiping idols again. They failed to pay attention to follow God. 
And I preached this message on, on the low Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, because we know that around the world, Sunday, Easter Sunday is the most exciting, and so people come from all over, but many of them just tip their hat to God and say, good to see you, buddy, I'll catch you at Christmas, right? What happened, what is what that? And then there's people who show up week in and week out. What does it come down to? And I'll tell you, it comes down to this. Some people are convinced. Some people are simply hedging their bets. Well, heaven or hell, I don't know if it's true or not. Anybody ever heard of Pascal's wager, right? It's like, well, you lay out all the things that are good and, and some of the things are bad. It's like, well, it makes more sense to me to go ahead and believe. If nothing else, I lived a good life. And if I die, I get to go to heaven versus hell. So yeah, I'll put my eggs in that basket. They are convinced. But many of them are convinced that they don't have to show up week in and week out. They just have to show up once or twice a year, pay homage to God, check the box, just so in case they die, which they will die, but in case they die, don't most people think they're going to go to heaven, right? And if you ask the average American, are you a believer? Sure. Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody ever been to a funeral where the person wasn't told that they were going to heaven? That's an awkward funeral. Been there done that but mostly we just go yeah we all hope for that no none of us are perfect but you know what the difference is some people are just convinced do you know that coming out of a life of church seven out of ten college students will walk away from their faith in college why? Because they get professors who are supposed to be the smart people and they start wrapping their minds up and going, how dumb are you to believe in this fable of Jesus Christ and the new life and the new world? And, you know, that's just, you know, that's the opiate of the masses trying to keep everybody calm, trying to keep them in line, trying to keep them a, a good life. Seven out of ten. I don't know about you, but that breaks my heart. It hurts my heart. And, and thank you, Bill, for your testimony because that's exactly the vision that we have here. We know that we've made a lot of people mad by only doing one service. But we used to have, uh, just a few years ago, we had five services every weekend. We had people in this building, people in this building, people in this building, kids over here, you know, youth over there, parents over here, all these things, trying to become all things to all people. But we felt like God was calling us together because we're not as large as we used to be. But I have a passion on my heart and the vision team came alongside and throughout time they just said, you know what? We feel God calling us together to be in unity and for to have intergenerational worship. Because when you, when you put the kids off somewhere else, uh, the youth particularly, we do have our kids somewhere else because they're very concrete at this age and they are learning and growing as Bill was talking about and that's great. But what I really wanted was some adults to come alongside some of the youth. And yes, adults, that means we may have to change our style of worship a little bit because if you are already a convinced or you are already converted, if you are already a believer, then you are so excited about more and more people coming to Jesus Christ, you're willing to get uncomfortable so that somebody else can get comfortable. Can I get an amen? Amen, yeah. And what I wanted was for parents and youth to be sitting together in worship because when they went to Cracker Barrel before, dad would look at the youth and say, what did you learn in church? And junior would go, oh, no, right? But if you're sitting in the same service, pinching them to keep them awake and they're having to pay attention, you say, what did you think about when the past? And it begins to open the conversation. I believe this, the downfall of our, down, of our nation is the downfall of the family. The downfall of the family is the downfall of the church. And church, we've got to do a better job of reaching, yes, our young people, but all people 
for the sake of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, so the big difference is why do some people come a few times a year and why do some people come week in and week out? And here's what one of the differences is, is that some are simply convinced and others are converted. Like these youth who go off to to, to college and lose their faith, the reason is they were simply indoctrinated into the faith And they were convinced, but they weren't really, truly converted where Jesus Christ came into their heart, into their lives, and changed their lives forever. When you are converted in Jesus Christ, that's the first and foremost thing that you have in your life. And you begin to order your life around that. You don't wake up on Sunday morning and go, oh, are we going to go to church today? I don't think so. I'm tired. We're going to stay home. We've had a busy week. Like, woo, we get to go to church today. When you are converted, you're excited about gathering together with other believers in Jesus Christ and worshiping a holy God. Can I get an amen? Question Thank you. Hold your applause to the end. Thank you. Uh, But yeah, the question I want to ask you, because I do believe that this is my holy discontent. I really want to bring millions. And uh, my brother Rob, who's uh, I think over in the Congo now and and asking for prayers, and he has hundreds of thousands of, of converts every time he goes out. I'm just so excited about that. The kingdom of God is growing, and, and I want to be like that, and I have a heart for it and a passion for it, but sometimes I feel like God has, has gifted me with a holy discontent of saying to the church, folks, you've got to wake up. We have got to do better than this. I was listening to a newly converted Christian who had been an atheist and fought against Christianity his whole life. And he said, this thing I know is Jesus is real. He died on the cross for my sins. He said, the church people, I don't understand them. I don't get it. We are the light and salt to the world and we've got to do a better job. But the question I want to do, ask everybody, are you really, really saved? Are you simply convinced up here Because if you're convinced up here, you can be unconvinced when somebody comes along with questions you don't know how to answer. It's usually things, well, I'd believe in God, but explain suffering in the world, explain evil in the world, explain heartache, explain why my mother died and and why my children are sick, explain this, you know. And all these things get to play in their minds. Cannot you hear the voice of Satan? Now, if God really loved you, right? Some of you, all of you probably, know somebody who's not an atheist, they're angry theist. And what they have is a poor theology because they were just simply convinced and not converted by a true life-changing experience of the risen Lord. And so... But if that's you this morning, if you're the one that said, maybe I'm just, I I love it when people just start squirming in their seats a little bit. I don't know. I I think I'm saved. Am I going to heaven? Are you going to heaven? You know, it's like, man, you don't have to doubt. You don't have to struggle. And like we talked about last week with doubting Thomas, God bless him. He's my brother in arms and and all that kind of stuff. But but what (laughs) we've seen what God can do with wild bills. Can I get an amen? Somebody who's been convinced somewhere along the way, but suddenly Jesus Christ comes in in a real and new and fresh way, changes their heart, takes away their heart of stone, gives them a heart of flesh. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you read the scriptures, Jesus, when he gets the masses in front of them, isn't that the time for the ooey gooey feel good sermon? And he usually says things like, well, I'm going to talk in parables, not so you'll get it, so you'll understand it. I'm going to talk in parables so that you're confused by it. And you go, he's just babbling. What is he talking about? And most of them walked away. But at the end of his preaching, Jesus would usually say something like that. He that has ears, let him hear. Drop the mic, right? He just walks out. And I'm like, Jesus, that's not how we do church. 
You've got new believers or, or people who are interested, and so you, you need to ease them into it. But there are so many people who are never going to be convinced. There are people who don't want to be convinced. They, a lot of atheists will be honest and say, I hope God's not real. Because <laughs> suddenly I'm going to be held accountable if he is. They're hoping he's not real. And it's not my job, and as much as I love apologetics, and I just want to take you line by line and line by line and, and show you the proof of the teaching. It actually takes more faith to be a non-believer than to be a believer in Jesus Christ. We talked about it last week. All of history is focused around one man, one event. The history and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many of you remember I Love Lucy? What did Ricky usually say when Lucy had messed up? He'd come home and say, Lucy, you got some explaining to do. Well, the people who are not believers have some explaining to do. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, so... I'm hoping that there are some that, that, that came last week and, and just had their interest peaked because it's really a heart question. It's not about a head question. It's about a heart question. And there are some who are coming back and saying, I'm hungry. I want to know more about what it's really all about. And so the question we want to ask this morning, and if you're already a believer, don't go to sleep on this because we are constantly evaluating ourselves and constantly calling ourselves to grow deeper in Jesus Christ. But the question is, once you give your life to Jesus, Christ what now one of my frustrations is for people who walk the aisle they get baptized and then we don't ever see them again have you heard the story about the bats in the belfry right many of you had this an old story and, and the, the trustees couldn't get them out and so they told the preacher and the preacher prayed them out he tried doing all these kind of things uh, they got shotgun blasts and all he did was just blow holes in the steeple because the bats would fly everywhere and they would come right back then the pastor had a great idea and so they trapped them all he brought them in he baptized them all he let them go and he's never seen them again right never seen them since Right? That's what some people think is I got my get out of hell free card so I don't have to do anything else. That is not true. Justification is just the beginning. Christ calls us to keep growing in sanctification. Now, how many of you remember 30 years ago? Right? Most of you, if you're over 35, you remember 30 years ago. I remember it crystal clear. You know why? Because my son was born 30 years ago. I can tell you how many trips we made to the hospital and they say, nope, not time yet, go home. The third time I'm like, nope, we ain't not going home. Uh, we're gonna work on God's time and God's gonna keep us here until it happens when so we just walk laps around the hospital. But I can tell you as if it's just still fresh in my mind 30 years ago. And I tell you that to tell you this, that the author of Hebrews wrote somewhere around 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you the atmosphere that he's writing into. There are many people who are being persecuted for their faith. There are many people who are being told by their families, you do not belong to us anymore because of their faith and trust in Christ. In Rome, they were actually dipping Christians in tar and lighting them on fire as a sign to everybody else that they need to, to renounce their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And yet there was all some people who were convinced many people saw Jesus resurrected, he ate, he, he walked, he talked, and, and he rose again in, into the cloud, into heaven, and he's coming back again. But when he didn't happen the next day or the next day or the week after that, some of their religious fervor began to wane. And so the author of Hebrews is writing encouragement to the Christians who are undergoing persecution and telling them, don't shrink 
back. The Apostle Paul telling them to persevere in the faith. The Apostle Paul talking about all of the, the trials and tribulations that he went in. He went from the number one persecutor of the church to being the number one persecuted in the church when he accepted Jesus Christ. Many believers walk away when their life doesn't magically get better. Like what Bible are you reading? It actually gets harder, it gets tougher. But I'm like Peter when, when Jesus said, so you wanna walk away? And Peter's like, where else can we go? We don't like what you're saying, but you and you alone have the words of eternal life. So for better or worse, we're hanging in there with you. But into this atmosphere, the author of Hebrews writes, and we're gonna take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. And the author writes, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Everybody say draw near. Let us draw near to God with sincere heart in full assurance of the faith. Having our hearts sprinkled, word to the Methodist. That's funny, people. Come on, to sprinkled, you know, the whole, yeah, okay. All right. Having their hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, word to the Baptist. That's funny, people. Come on. You know, the whole argument over how much water does it take, sprinkle, dunk until they bubble, you know, all that kind of, all right. He got them all in there. But Jesus is the great high priest. We don't have to keep offering the animal sacrifices over and over again because Jesus is the great high priest and through his body, the curtain has been torn open and we have access to a holy God. So let us draw near to God. Verse 23, let us hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Hang in there. We just got a little bit more here. But let's take a look at some of these lessons. We don't just read this, but it's like we need to understand it and we need to apply it. And if we're saying we are Christians, what now? What is expected of us? What are we supposed to do now? And the first thing was is to draw near to God. Not just once or twice a year. Not just a week or here, not just when it's convenient, but we are called to gather. Do you know what happened in the book of Acts when the Christian church was started right after Pentecost? You know what it says in Acts chapter 2? It says they met together what? Daily. Thank you for the three people who knew that were still awake to shout it out. They met together daily. We're like, oh, no, I can't do daily. I can do once, maybe not twice a week, but daily, that's a little bit much, don't you think? Man, it depends on how on fire you are. But we are to draw near to God in every means possible, in every way possible. John Wesley talked about the means of grace, of getting God's grace into us. We draw near to God through worship and through study and through prayer, through our devotions and our teachings and, and meeting together and working together. But we are constantly on this journey of drawing closer to God. I had a youth pastor who explained it, I thought, a great way. He was talking to the youth and he was saying that if you are a Christian, hallelujah, but here's the problem, that Jesus is at the headwaters and we're downstream. If you don't keep swimming toward him, you're gonna keep getting farther and farther away. What does the scripture say? That we are to work, to do everything in our power to draw near to him. The second thing is to persevere through hard times. Everybody say persevere. That means hang tough, hang in there. 
everybody thinks they're all alone because that's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to think that only you are having trouble in your marriage. Only you are having health concerns and that are having challenges along the way. And he wants to isolate you and he wants you to get angry with God. Many of these Christians that the author was writing to were being persecuted. They were being beaten. They were being whipped. They were being imprisoned. They were being beheaded. They were being torched. They were being crucified for their faith in one name, Jesus Christ. One man that they put their faith in and said, this world doesn't mean anything to me. Jesus said, you can kill, you know, don't worry about the one who can kill the body, but worry about the one who can kill both body and soul. But how many people do we know, maybe us along the way, where God didn't act or, or respond the way that he, we thought he ought to? How many of you want to be God? Liars. We all want to be God. Isn't that what it is? It's pride. I don't want anybody to be in charge of me. I want to be in charge of me. I want to do what I want to do, and I want it to be okay, right? But when you come before a holy God, it's not a question of, will I stand before you? To your knees, you will fall, and you submit your life to him no matter what comes your way. Paul called everything that he was going through light and momentary trials and tribulations, right? Ah, these things, no big deal. Yeah, beatings, whipping, persecution, imprisonment. It's all good for God's glory. And then we believe he was beheaded after all that. And it's like, he's like, it doesn't matter because you know what happens? When you lose this body, and we're all gonna lose these bodies, we get new bodies. I was listening to a pastor and he was talking about one of those exciting shows. I don't even know if it's on anymore. 24, is it still out there? I don't know, okay. But anyway, a super secret agent man who's running the country because of persecution and all these things. And it was like in season four and he's just glued to it. He's watching it and, and just doesn't have time for backup. So he's going in to face the terrorists alone and, and the pastor's shouting, don't go in alone. And then suddenly he remembers, wait a minute, this show's been... Uh, coming back for another four seasons. He's got to win. It's okay. He's going to survive this. He's, and that's what we as Christians should have that thought. Wait a minute. We know the end of the book. We know the end of the story. We're going to not only survive it, we're going to thrive and we're going to celebrate in the victory. Can I get an amen? So we hang in there, we persevere. God, I don't get it. God, I don't understand. But God, I believe in you, I trust in you, and you're gonna get me through this. But you know what? I give you the praise and the glory, and I will follow you no matter what the cost. Number three is to spur. Everybody say spur. That's a rough word, isn't it? I, many of you know that back in my former days, I, I did some, some cattle rustling and roping and all that kind of stuff. I never got my spurs, though. I never figured it out. A lot of horses will simply do what they're supposed to do when you just kind of gently nudge them, and they know they're supposed to jump or go forward or go faster or whatever. But, man, there are some that we call just recalcitrant. They just they want to do what they want to do. And that's the ones where you have to get the spurs out and they're little tiny spokes on a wheel on the back of your boot. And when you hit them with that, man, you got their attention. What is the word that they translated here that we, the church, are supposed to do for one another? And that is to spur, everybody say spur, spur one another on to love and good deeds. Now, God bless you. Some of you were born with spurs. Oh, you know who you are. Yeah, don't, don't pretend like you don't know. I remind you that it's not spurs without definition. It's for encouragement. It's for love and encouraging one another to grow by in love and doing good deeds. We want to be salt and light in the world and how will they know we are Christians? They will know we are Christians by our... And we have to do the hard work of the church of spurring, meeting together, encouraging one another in the faith to love and good deeds. And then finally, number four, is to meet together regularly, not semi-annually, not even weekly. The early church met daily. 
And then um, uh, from Proverbs, we get this, 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 this wisdom that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person needs another, right? As iron sharpens iron, one person encourages and, and agitates and spurs and brings them up into a growth and faith and maturity in Jesus Christ. We are called to be together. A lot of people say, well, I can, I can worship God on, on the golf course. No, you can't. Because one minute you're praising God for the 300-yard drive that actually found the fairway, the next time you're cursing him for the pitching wedge that went in the sand. Like, no, that doesn't work. You're thinking about golf and what God can do for you lately. Like, no. Or, or then ask your friends like, well, I worship on the course. Great, we talked about Hebrews chapter 10. What'd y'all talk about today? Man, if they're talking about Jesus, I'm, I'm all for that kind of church. Oh, God bless them, but... But the idea is that we are called to worship together. And, and the author of Hebrews says, do not neglect the meeting together as is the habit of some. It's not just me, Pastor Greg, saying, I think we should do this because I want a big crowd. And, and you know it, you feel it. When there's more people, there's more energy, there's more excitement. But it's not about that. It's all the people coming together in Christ to worship a holy God. Being a Christian is so much more than just showing up. It's committing to a lifestyle of drawing near to God, persevering through hard times, spurring one another on to love and good deeds, and meeting together regularly to praise God, to praise his holy name, fanning the flames of faith in obedience to God, building his kingdom here on earth, and looking forward to the day when we can see our Savior face to face in a place of light, love, peace, and joy forevermore. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Let's pray. Our gracious and our loving Heavenly Fathers, we come before you on this day. Lord, I, I just confess that I have not been a stellar Christian my whole life. I'm still not there. I'm still struggling. I'm still trying. I'm still growing. But Lord, I have the heart of Peter that says, where else can I go with Thomas, we struggle with our faith. We struggle with our doubts. We struggle with the hard times. How can anything good come out of a crucifixion? And yet, Lord, as we read the scriptures, how many times did you try to tell the disciples what was going to happen and why it had to happen? And yet, Lord, we today are so far removed from this thousands of years that many of us, the religious fervor has, has cooled off. We have forgotten what it's truly all about. Somehow we think if we're just nice people, that's all it takes, that more are going to be in heaven than in hell. And that is not true. That is not your gospel. That is not your word. The invitation goes out to all. But Jesus, you just simply said, ye that has ears, let them hear. If you want it, it's there. But we have to choose. You have already extended your love and invitation toward us. And Lord, it's we who need to respond to you. Lord, we don't have to know it all. We don't have to get it all. We don't have to understand it all. We come to you with a childlike faith, just a mustard seed sized grain of faith, just a small, but it overcomes great doubts. So Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that's not sure, if they don't know where their eternal destiny is, if they're just unsure, if they're even saved, if they're maybe just feeling like, maybe I'm just convinced and I'm not truly converted, then Lord, I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're just coming upon them. That you're just, you've got, they've got a lump in their throat, a lump in their throat. It's like, yes, Jesus, I want more. I want to know that I know that I know that I'm saved. But Lord, save me from a milk toast kind of faith where it's just a watered down kind of faith where I just show up at church a little bit, kick a five in the plate and think that I'm good with you. No, Lord, I want to be your disciple. 
I want to be together with other Christians. I want to work together. I want to serve together. I want to be encouraged and I want to be encourager uh, for others as we grow together. Let us draw near to you. Lord, light this place on fire with the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, draw us all closer to you. In Christ's holy name we pray. And everybody in the Lord said, amen. amen.